what we do um, in this paper is we run experiments with AI agents uh, in controlled environments. So we basically let the agents play games economists uh, know a lot about. Now, the reason we do so is because we, ba we simply want to bring data and inform this debate on the effects of AI on marketplaces, which is very lively and cro cross-disciplinary. Okay? Now, um, this was a very fruitful exercise to us, so we also want now to advocate um, for using more of these uh, experiments uh, to replace or complement the experiments that we make with human subjects in the lab um, to learn about economic behavior or uh, to test our theories, okay? So we do lots of things in this paper. I'm going to focus not on the prisoner's dilemma thing, which we do for obvious reasons, but I'm going to focus on the oligopoly model. Now, we know a lot about reinforcement learning since last night. Uh, wonderful talk and yesterday. Um, I just want to say that this is not a board game. So in the application we, we are playing with, the, state, the perception is going to be not the state of the board, but past prices, perhaps demand. Uh, the actions are not going to be legal moves, but prices, the own price, and the reward is not going to be a plus minus one depending on whether you win or not, but it's going to be a stream of profits coming to these agents. Okay? Now, Q learning in reinforcement learn sorry, Q learning is a class of reinforcement learning algorithms. It's very natural. I guess we agree now that it's also popular. They use it. This is the building block of those fancy algorithms that we saw throughout the day yesterday. And um, um, it's also not fancy. But you know, the version that we employ is what is called the tabular solution method. So this means that we expect um, fancier version. As we add sophistication to the algorithm, we expect these insights to hold up. Um, OK, so and this also means that it's very simple. So there are just three key parameters here. The first one is alpha, which tells you at which speed the new information which is coming in from these rewards is incorporated into the existing body of knowledge. The second parameter is the extent of experimentation beta. And the third parameter is the discount factor. Okay? Now, the baseline game is just a simple plain vanilla oligopoly model um, with two firms, differentiated goods, cost and marginal cost, and logic demand. Okay? So this is the workhorse model that we use in I.O. to read data. So it's been extensively used. We're not going to read data. We're going to actually write data with this model, and we're going to read off uh, insights from this data. Now, in the baseline implementation, we're going to allow these agents to have a limited memory. What this means here is going to be a one-period memory, so they're going to remember what, only what last period prices were. And then we're going to let them choose prices on a grid of 15 price points. Okay? Now, being this a very rich model, it allows us to do many things, right? So we can play with a number of players. We can play with asymmetries in demand, in qualities, with asymmetries in cost supply. And then uh, we can play with the demand shifter. We can play with differentiation. We can also play with the complexity of the model. So what we do is we increase the memory, and we increase and we double the size of the action set. I have a backup slide. What I can tell you about these exercises is that what I'm going to present today is robust uh, to these uh, interventions. Okay. Now, our approach is really, we're looking, we have this alpha, beta, delta, and we're looking on a grid of alpha, beta, deltas. For each point on this grid, we're going to have this, um, we're going to run 1,000 sessions. And one session is two Q learning algorithms, right, starting with no knowledge and playing for a long time. I'm going to report results, which are averaged across sections and sometimes across the grid. What Q learning means in this context is that these guys, they will start with no knowledge, random strategies. Okay? A strategy here is a mapping from, past, from last period prices to today's prices. Then over the course of the session, the strategy will evolve. Okay? How well actions that performed well in the past, as we learned yesterday, are going to be reinforced. And uh, what we see is both actions and strategies, so we can actually report on both. Now, the results here are that these two Q learning agents, they typically, sorry, uh, they learn to play, okay? They learn to convert, sorry, they learn to cooperate, and they actually learn to, con to collude. By learning to play, I mean that this sequence of strategies eventually stops evolving, so they converge. 
This is not obvious at all. Susan yesterday told us that there is some incompleteness in the theory in the sense that there is no theoretical guarantee that this would happen. And the, the reason is that this is a highly unstationary world because there are these two Q learning algorithms playing with each other, even though, remember, they don't even know that they're playing against each other, okay? Um, they come, all of them converge. On average, it takes 1.6 million interaction over the grid. Is that fast? Well, yes. In CPU times, it takes minutes, not, uh, not days like yesterday. So it's fairly simple. And it's somewhat slow in the sense that they, you cannot put this in production, right? So if you want to use the Amazon API to deploy these algorithms to price your goods, that's going to be very expensive to you. So what this means is that you will have to train them uh, with data of policy. But I think companies that are offering repricing services, they have plenty of data to use to train these algorithms. So how do we measure cooperation? So we measure here, I'm going to use this delta, which is the gap between the full collusive profits and the static Nash profits. And I'm going to tell you what is the percentage of this delta which is ripped off by these algorithms, by these uh, Q-learning agents, OK? And this is over the alpha beta grid. And the message from this is that cooperation is across the board. It goes from, say, 50% around here to 99% around here. It's maximized when they experiment a lot and when the information is incorporated slowly into the existing body of knowledge. Second fact uh, has to do with delta, the third element of the grid. Uh, as economists, we think a lot about deltas. So as you would expect, cooperation goes up uh, okay, with, um, with frequency of interaction. And uh, another nice feature that we document is that here, uh, cooperation actually breaks down for values of delta which make economic sense. Okay? In the video game paper, they use 0.99, but that's a really high interest factor if you, if you, if you think about it. Okay? Another thing that we learned from this exercise is that, the, um, and you have to trust me on this, uh, that the amount of cooperation that we're getting is way lower than the one which is implied by the underlying mainstream model that we uh, used to think uh, that we used to think about collusion, okay? What this means is that we, we're missing the relevant incentive constraint, and, and so we, we really need to go back to the drawing table to understand what's actually going on and have models that incorporate this learning feature to understand what are the relevant incentive constraints. Forget about the usual threshold that we think about. The last thing I want to do is to give you a glimpse of the strategies and about collusion. How am I going to do that? Well, think about the following exercise. Take one session, we have these players play and learn their strategies. After they learn, we let them play a little bit. Then I shock the, the system by having player one play uh, the Nash price, a lower price, and see what happens. Now, what happens here is that there's going to be a transition phase, and then prices are going to go back up, not quite at the same level. So let me zoom in. Uh, uh, so what's going on here is, of course, I mean, as you would expect, after player one uh, lowers his price, player two comes in and punishes player one. And then after that, both players, they go back uh, to uh, the collusive strategies. This is what happens to profits. So three comments, and I'm done on these last slides. The slide. So the first comment is that these are fairly sophisticated strategies for these algorithms to learn, okay? So you have to learn to punish, to sacrifice short-term gains for the long-term benefit of restoring the cooperative relationship, okay? You also have to learn to move from the punishing phase to the cooperative phase, okay? Uh, uh, so uh, um, another um, uh, important observation is um, in a sense that um, that connects with what we saw yesterday is that um, this thing uh, slowly goes back up um, to the cooperative level. What we learned from this exercise, which was also surprising to yesterday's speaker, is that they, these algorithms, they tend to overcome uh, this memory issue that they have by using the limited memory in clever ways. So we are economists. So we know that yesterday's price can signal a lot about what happened. And so they seem to sort of economize and overcome uh, these limits. Okay. Um, uh, time is up. Uh, I guess what I want you to take out of this exercise is that um, 
we're not saying that we should be worried or that you know we're gonna see higher prices in online marketplaces. I guess what we're just saying is that it's worthwhile to keep on looking uh, at these kind of exercises. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.